Okay, I'm going to finish up with some of the early uh, 20th century appliances. Um, we've already talked in the PowerPoint presentation, we've talked about angles appliances, the, the E arch and the pin and tube and the ribbon arch and then finally uh, edgewise. But the deal is, I'm not, looking at the, what's done today, I'm not quite sure that edgewise has won. But uh, to some extent, edgewise won out. But back then, it was not obvious that edgewise was going to be the hot ticket. There were lots of other approaches, which for a while were, were much more uh, popular. Uh, I'll tell you one here. It's uh, the labial lingual appliance. And the deal, the, the big deal with the labial lingual appliance, you know, we have, we had bands, and I, I suppose I should do that the way it is. We had bands with buckle tubes, but John Valentine Mershon, and the reason I say that is because the, the major lecture at the AAO is by, by Mershon. What he developed, and I'm going to draw Okay, what molar band is that? Okay, fine. I, I'm, I'm talking to the right group. And what he developed was an attachment like that that went on the lingual and into that was thing like that, which was soldered to an arch wire. And so this gave, um, this now gave something like that. You could have a labial arch wire, and you could also have, with this thing, you could have a lingual arch wire. Hence the labial lingual uh, technique, and in fact, what the yeah. I should point out here, draw draw this a little bit neater. At the end, you would solder a piece of dead soft gold on like that, and so you'd you'd put it in. Actually, I, my let's see, I guess that's good enough. You'd put it in, and then this could be bent under, and so the, the, uh, the lingual arch wire was fixed removable. It was fixed as far as the patient's concerned, removable as far as you were concerned, because you could reach in with a B scaler and pull, pull this out. Uh, so as a result, what we... It's early enough in the day, I can pick it up. If we were a little later in the day, I'd have to kick it over there and get someone to help me. Okay. So, and none of these damn things work, but anyway. So the labial lingual technique ultimately ended up looking like this. And you'd have bands, bands, you'd have the lingual, you'd have this. And so, um, give this a little dimension here. And given labial lingual, then there's, you could put all kinds of little springs on there. You could put uh, elastic hooks. Um, 
this would usually be 038, 04, 0, something like this. And, and they had an interesting arrangement in that if we look at the upper, they had what was called a high labial, which came, which came up like that. And then, and this is the labial arch wire here, and then they would solder little things on like that. So they could, they could move the teeth, they could retract the teeth with minimal contact. And if they wanted to, if they wanted to rotate a tooth, uh, they'd put on, let's see, what color will bands be today? They'd put on a band with a horizontal thing like this, and then they would use this to rotate a tooth. And um, this was generally non-extraction. Strangely enough, uh, this was the thing, uh, the way I was, <laughs> this was the major thing at Michigan when I went through. And so here are some um, labiolingual appliances. Uh, look at the lingual bracket, um, anything like that. <clears throat> and viola. And you'll see that uh, uh, it was high labial even if it was used in the lower arch. So you can see there uh, one of these. Is this the one that has? Yeah, that's, that's a high labial even though it's in the lower arch. You can see the, the uh, fingers pointing down. Are the teeth be tied to the front here? Mm, nope. No, they, well, if, they, if you needed to move something, they would be tied to the front. They'd use, uh, they'd use a grass line, something that would shrink, or, they'd, or they could, if, if a tooth were, were, well, here, I've already got it. The teeth were, if a tooth were there and they wanted it here, they could put a little finger spring in the back of it. In fact, uh, the w one thing that you folks are missing, you'll never have a chance to solder gold. It's the most wonderful, it's the closest thing to, to putting in a perfect three unit bridge. It's the closest thing in orthodontics you can do to that. Okay. Labial lingual. Um, in fact, if you go to the, uh, the AO meeting in Rocky Mountain, the uh, modular, the Wilson modular technique is in fact labial lingual uh, for the 21st century. Um, uh, Robert uh, Wilson was a great orthodontist at Harvard. His son went to Case Western Reserve, so he'd come to visit his son, and I would have him come in and talk to the young doctors. And he would show what he could do with labiolingual, which was really quite remarkable. And his son was uh, my lab tech, and so if you go to uh, look at the Wilson modular technique, he'll be up there telling you how great it is, but it's, it's essentially a modification of the old labial lingual. Okay, now, how would you like an appliance where you didn't have to bend any wire, that had slippery brackets, no t ligature ties, that would un unravel things almost instantaneously? And this is the Johnson twin wire technique. And they called the twin wire automatic. See, all these things were happening, you know, the uh, Edgewise came out in 19, in 29. Um, this, was, this was a competition um, in 1929, and what it was, let me make sure I get this. Um, 
see how, how to do this. That's it's a young it's a young child hasn't had a chance to wear off the mammalons yet, and here is an ant here, and this is the bracket for the twin wire technique. In other words, this is it. Big, and essentially. What went into that were two O one O stainless steel, and they came back to oops, sorry about that to a piece of hypodermic tubing, and that in turn went into the buckle tube, and the cap to this. If we look at this, the, the bracket, they had a cap that slid over that. And it, in three dimensions, it looked like, like this. And to tell which, it had an imprint of a key, keyhole on one end, so that you'd know which one was slightly larger so that you could slip it, slip it on that way. Now, I, I, let me tell you a little bit the way this was constructed. Because, by the way, 2010 arch wires were such that you could, you could uh, anything. You, you remember the last time, so long ago, when I showed you the pin and tube appliance and how it, had, it was heavy and you had to slowly unbend it, unbend it? This you could engage any tooth, no matter how. You, you could have straightened my teeth with, with this. And it happened very quickly, automatically. And I'll show you how it was done. I'll draw it here, up here quickly. Take a piece of hypodermic tubing, and it was about, oh, inch. And into that would go the 010. And then there was a device which would crinkle the ends. And I'll show you. This is the device right here. Actually, And the deal is it had a cog wheel on the end so that you could, I don't know if this works well enough, but you, you could fit the two wires in there like that and then turn this and that, that would grunch them up. So the next thing you'd see is, is, let's see here. I guess they're red. like that. Then you would crack this and so suddenly you would have something that looked like this. Like so. Then this gizmo here, if you come close to see if I have it. I had. Oh, here it is. What you what you would do is you would break that, and so I have a thing from a ballpoint pen. And if I could just break this bloody thing, I thought I there. Okay. Now this is what we have right here, and we go back like this, and put this in. If I could just see to get that in there. <laughs> okay. Pretend that that's, oh, that came up. But anyway, then what you would do is you would turn this and open it up, and that would spread, spread. These were crinkled. And so what you'd end up with is,
you'd end like this because inside it was all messed up. And so you, uh, that's, if you ever wondered why you had all of these things, this was, we'd use those to measure. You just measure the, the size from buckle tube to buckle tube and the scale there and you would measure how much you pulled out like this and that was that was your arch wire and it was very no no bending nothing uh, and I'll show you how it worked it was it was why yeah sure And while I'm doing this, viola, twin wire, twin wire, twin wire, twi all twin wire. Okay, so let's start off with Friction, so it, could, so it couldn't come out. Yeah, if I could make this thing work, this is that one is a little old and worn, but here we go. And and let's see. What's a good color for arch wires in this? Okay. And, oh, bloody hell. Excuse me. Better is the enemy of good enough. There we go. Okay. Now, what there would be here on, on the and here would be a sliding hook like that. And it would back, back up an open coil spring. Yeah. And the deal was they would hook class two elastics to this, okay? I, I don't have this quite, I, the, the buckle tube is supposed to extend a little farther forward, but what this would do is it would distalize, quote, if that be a word, the upper molars, and at the same time, surprise, 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 you'd lose anchorage down below. But once you got a class one molar relationship with this device, then what you would do is you would take this off. Yeah, this is it here. And it's green. And then you would take the hook you pinch it so that it was stuck to the buckle tube then the class 2 elastics then would retract the anteriors so first you got the spring um, on there to get the molar relationship then you'd pinch the hook and keep on going, and that would give you, that would retract the incisors. Um, the deal with the, and I think, yeah, you got, yeah, you got, yeah, okay. 
Um, some down, I, I think there's some that have uh, better caps than this. But the problem with it, this, it was non-extraction. Yeah, you could play around. You could play around with extraction, but it just didn't. It just didn't work uh, very well. Um, you could on the on the caps. You you have one there. You could you could solder hooks onto uh, the caps if you had if you had a canine that was high and dry. You could take one of these and you could you could glue to a tooth. You could is called black copper cement, and you could take one of these one of these and use that to bring. Uh, the canine down. Now, if you, you remember the picture of, of Angle's pin and tube stuff, and to some extent, uh, in his first incarnations, the edgewise didn't look all that much easier. Look at this. In fact, I used to say if I some if, if at retirement I wanted to get a revenge on orthodontics for some reason, I would reintroduce the twin wire with uh, nitinol and uh, because it's it's an absolutely magic appliance it takes five minutes to tell people how it works uh, etc so it was uh, it was very popular um, the director of the ABO Earl Shepard was a great uh, advocate of this Jesus What? Is that like a piggyback wire? Is that what it's like, or is it different? What? What that was there. Oh, it's not a piggyback. Just it's just two two o one o wires. Oh, I see. Just two o one o wires. Um, um, where's the, where's the twin one? Let me see the one that that shows this the best. Now this shows a single wire, although. You can almost see the keyhole. Um, this uses a different kind of uh, cap, but this is twin wire, and you can see the two the two wires. And they were so they were so supple that you could you could ligate anything in, and uh, and because there were two, you could lift one up, and I should have done this first. This never works worth a damn for me. Um, okay. Now you can all talk amongst yourself while that dries. Anyway, um, that was the that was the, the the biggie, and I still think if somebody somebody could make a couple bucks by introducing a modern version of that, well. You know, uh, seeing how everything's non-extraction nowadays with, with magic wires, uh, essentially, they beat me to it. Um, then, now we have uh, the universal appliance. Nineteen twenty-nine. You can see all these appliances came out. Uh, the 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 First World War was over. Everybody was coming back. Uh, there was a, a baby boom, and so there were lots of different appliances developed. Um, this was by Spencer Atkinson. And this is the Spencer Atkinson is the guy that uh, Angle thought was going to take over his school. And this was let me see if I get the oh yeah, I see I got this. That was the the, uh, the, the ribbon arch bracket. And you remember um, 
Atkinson was very impressed by the open tube appliance. And the open tube appliance had brackets There were just open tubes like that. And so, and he was impressed with this because of, the, of its ease at handling mesial and distal axial inclination problems. And so this was like that. And the arch wire would just snap in. So there, oh, no arch wire, no, no, uh, no ligation. I guess it grew the face like it's supposed to nowadays. Um, so he liked that. So what, what, as I've told you before, he cut a slot in the ribbon arch bracket so that he could have O14. He could have the ribbon arch, and he could he also added a lingual. And his lingual appliance, um, it's kind of clever. See, this was. Let me see if I can draw do this. Sometimes I have to decide whether the time it's worthwhile for me to figure things out like that. The um, the lingual arch would go in like that. This would be going on around, and that would snap. You can see how that would snap into place. So there were lots of lingual attachments, but this was the, was the, the universal technique, um, and it was because of this that Ang Atkinson cl uh, Angle closed his practice. This was very popular on the West Coast. A classmate of mine wrote the definitive text on the universal appliance, because the deal is, when we got out here, we had to go someplace to figure out how to move teeth. You know, we, you, you can't think the canines back, you know. You, you have to go someplace where they teach you how to do stuff. And uh, this was, this is still used. You, you've heard the expression, stolarize your molars. It's where you take the first molars, upper first molars, and tip them down so the lingual cusps are really socked in between the first and the second. And Arnold Edgar Stoller was the uh, outstanding authority on the universal appliance. Um, actually, going back to your, um, going back to this, I forgot, to, there's something interesting about this. If we look at that bracket from the front, oh Jesus, never mind. Going to do it like this. It was possible, rather than to have a cut like this, you, the the front could be cut out like that. And if it were cut out like that, then pretty much any size arch wire could go into there. In other words. To lock it in, all you do is just take a, a pair of hot pliers and go. And this is called the swirl tube. So in, in other words, if, uh, if avoiding tying in is a big deal, we've known how to do that for nearly 100 years. In fact, that's really kind of crafty. They're the swirl tube. Oh, and also I, sh I, I showed you this before, but maybe didn't. this is also held in place. By a brass, <coughs> brass pin holds it in and it gets bent over like that. And this, if you turn um, the ribbon arch bracket upside down, then you have the beg bracket of today. That was uh, the beg bracket, uh, which was, was popular in Australia because when, well, they could just stamp it out of heavy band material. 
They didn't have to be gold. They didn't have to, you know, it's a long way, Australia is a long ways away. So, and also uh, for something like this, in, they sometimes would, would, on the arch wire, they would solder spurs like this to, for torque control. They'd, they'd snap the arch wire in, and then those vertical spurs would provide uh, the torque control. Um, this was stainless steel, so it meant that they could no longer use gold brackets because the stainless, it's like, you know, indentures, you can't put porcelain up against plastic. Uh, you can't put stainless steel up against gold. It'll eat it up. So they had to have, they had to have stainless steel brackets. And the, the folks, this was mostly popular on the West Coast and in uh, Latin America. Uh, the Orthodox there put up a few thousand bucks each to get a technician who would make these brackets for the universal technique. And that company still exists today. What would you guess it's called? Unitech? Yes, Unitech. It's a you know, obscure little company, but that, that, was, that was the deal. Um, just because he had added a stainless steel, and in fact, um, because, because uh, soldering stainless steel was, was difficult, they used telephone dialers to control a device which was used to solder things. If you put a piece of metal in between those, clamped it down, and then if you wanted a heavy duty weld, you dial nine. If you wanted a phone, for example, on your uh, cordless phones, um, they have tone and the, the, other, the other setting is if you dial nine, it's tick, 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 nine times. If you put it on tone, it's just a tone control. But uh, the, when they had so many of these, uh, these things, it was able to come, it, it was, they were able to come up easily with a welding machine that people could use to put on, because now they had, it's like that, and you weld them on like so. Let me see if I can get this, oh. Viola. Now, the last one, and it's too bad I don't have the, the rest because I could almost do the next one. Well, never mind, because he can't be here in uh, May. Uh, but anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll figure out something. This is the Norwegian system. And it was by Viggo Viggo Andresen. Uh, in in Scandinavia, it's a big deal in the summertime. Everybody goes someplace. I remember my wife was in uh, there one time with a daughter, and uh, she fell and, and cut her leg and it was in the summer, and it was a very, very, had a very difficult time finding somebody who could sew it up because it was summer and the people who could afford Orthodox were long gone. And that was, that was Andresen's problem. He wanted something that would help him to retain his class two correction when his um, perhaps overly privileged patients 
had gone off to Gestadt or someplace like that. And this was, well, the deal was, according to the, the, um, the folks who were thinking about uh, this at the time, you, ha you had to uh, shake the bone in order to activate it. That you, if you shook the bone, it would activate it, etc. So he called this his appliance, what? No, yeah, the shaker, <laughs> the activator, the first of the uh, functional appliances. In fact, R Wilhelm Rue and Julius Wolff talked about shaking the bone in order to, to uh, increase, not to increase its length or size, but to increase its robusticity, the, the uh, the internal anatomy uh, to make it more, uh, to make it more well, robust. And here is the deal. Let me see here if I can if I can do this. And I'll draw you. Let me see if I can do this. That's if we if we chop the mouth. And I think we need don't need that. If we chop the mouth in half, that would be an activator. This is the line of occlusion along there. Uh, sometimes this activator, they would have a, a little spring to move teeth, but the big deal was it had an arch wire like this that came back And this, 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 uh, the, the position, they usually, he usually had the incisors end to end. And the idea was, if we, if we look, if we look at, an upper tooth, like so, oh, I need to, that. Ah, here we go. It, where it goes between the teeth, it was trimmed so that there would be expansion, like so. And then if we, if we look down on this, it would be, let me see here. It would be trimmed uh, on the upper arch, like this, so that as the teeth erupted, they would tend to go distally. And in the lower arch, in the lower arch, it would be trimmed the, the eruption grooves on the lower arch would be trimmed so that as the teeth erupted, they would go forward. But there was this thing on there, which was designed to keep things from going forward too far, or if the lower incisors were going to go forward, they were going to have to go forward uh, bodily. Um, so it was, well, it was, it, it was quite an interesting appliance. Uh, let me see. Yeah.
because because Wolf and uh, Rue had said you had to activate the bone. Uh, there was a guy named Karl Heupel. Anybody here speak German? Uh, I, I, I can never remember where the, the double dot goes. Karl Heupel was a, in, in Europe at the time, you had to go to medical school first, then you went to dental school, and uh, he, was, um, he was a periodontist. And, but he was a great, a great champion of the activator because you know he thought he thought he was growing they were growing bone and supposedly he was invited to the Norwegian Dental Society remember Norway was was occupied by the way one of the members of ABBA um, was a Norwegian uh, who was Norwegian whose mother uh, had an affair with an SS officer and so when the war was over Anafried, that's one of the A's in ABBA, Anafried could not stay on in Norway. So she went to Sweden because they didn't hate her there because Sweden was never occupied. Anyway, he was invited to the Norwegian Dental Society and he showed a picture of twins with really bad class twos. And one of the twins got an activator and the other got nothing. And he showed the pictures at the end, and they're really remarkably different, and then he showed histological sections. And the president of the Norwegian Dental Society stood up and said, are we to believe that those sections are of those, that patient with the activator? And he said, ah, yes, unfortunately, uh, she died of typhus, unfortunately. Um, he escaped anything after the war. He was the head of the department in, um, in Austria. And I lectured there one time and said, hey, what are you, what's going on with Heupel? What do you, tell, tell me something about him. And they didn't want to talk about Heupel at all. But Heupel was one of the ones who popularized this appliance um, during, during the occupation. Uh, this was, I don't, we also have to have the, the Herbst appliance. But Herbst did his thing and then kind of disappeared. So it wasn't until the, uh, oh, the 1970s and 80s that the Herbst appliance was, was rediscovered. So probably this is, this is the basis of all functional appliances. And you ask yourself, what do functional appliances have in common? Do they have in common that they're on one jaw, two jaws, they're made of plastic, they're made of steel. Um, what, do, what do all functional appliances have in common? All functional appliances. One thing that they share, one effect that they share. They require active positioning of the lower jaw forward. Yeah, yeah. They just, they just change the position. Activator, Frankel, Bimler. Um, so this was, the, this was the first one to do it. There was a, uh, sometimes they called this the monoblock. Pierre Robin thought that the French race was, was threatened by tongue swallowing. He called it glossoptosis. And so he came up with a device called the monoblock, which was almost identical to this, the purpose of which was to just bring the mandible forward so the French would have enough, ex you know, live long enough to drop their rifles. But anyway, trigger warning, <laughs> trigger warning. In any event, those are, those are the uh, appliances that uh, were fighting for attention. And when I was here, we were trained, we just started to be trained in edgewise, but, um, we used, we used activators, twin wire, and labiolingual. And in my hands, twin wire, I produced patients that looked like little frogs. I mean, it was just awful. And the activator, the activators that I made, I'd put them in and they'd push them out, put them in, push them out. But then again, that's a long time ago. And these were the appliances that were fighting uh, with, 
with the edgewise appliance. And you can see it's a battle that, well, for example, uh, St. Louis University used to be considered the, 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 the number one uh, clinical program, and it was a number one clinical program because the head there decided that he was going to go with edgewise, tweed edgewise. And so St. Louis University was far, far ahead of all the other programs that were teaching twin wire and labiolingual, stuff like that. But this is, this is where the functional appliances came from, and this is where, essentially, orthodontics came from. Next time, I'm going to tell you, uh, can you turn off the, the, the recording?